Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to our Wednesday webinar series. We have the McMahon Group with us here today. Um, don't forget that the uh, survey link is in the chat and um, Kevin at the very end will give you the password for credits for today. So welcome McMahon Group and Kevin, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Beth. I appreciate everyone logging in today to be with us for our webinar on driving member satisfaction and club success for today and tomorrow. During the webinar today, if you have any questions, Beth has arranged for those to be answered. If you go into the chat room and just enter your question there, and we will wrap up the meeting today with answering all those questions that come in. So please go into the chat room. I'd like to introduce the firm um, on the next slide. It will, will tell us a little bit more about the McMahon Group. Bill McMahon is our senior partner. Bill joined the club, our, our chairman of the firm. Bill started the firm 39 years ago as an architect club president of the Racket Club, a board member of Bell Reef Country Club, and has done over 2,000 clubs around the country during that time at the club um, with the McMahon Group. Chris Coulter, like me, longtime general manager, has been at several prestigious clubs around the United States, has been with the McMahon Group going on four years now. He's done an excellent job with the club consulting. And as most of you know me, I've been in Florida for about 13 years now in Jupiter. And Lisa and I continue to reside there and do business out of there. Uh, past president of CMAA and managed several clubs around the country. So we'll move on to the webinar and go from there. My portion of the webinar discusses the amenities, providing amenities for multi-generational members. We like to say that every member of the club is a member of a family. So when we talk about having family activities and family um, services and amenities, four members, that's not just the 12 year old member of the club, that's everyone from cradle to grave. So it's vital that we provide amenities for everyone that comes in the club. However, as the next slide will show, the average age of members today joining the club is about 42 years old. This chart comes from the United States Census Bureau. And as you can see kind of towards the middle there, in 1957 was kind of the height of the baby boom generation. Now all those baby boomers are turning 65 years old this year, those born in 57. And after 1957, the birth rates throughout the United States declined until about 1973. And what that means is um, the market for members also has declined, but now we're on the upswing. Since 1980, um, the birth rate has rebounded. So we see the next 10 years in the, in the club industry as one that's really gonna be booming for us. Those born right around 1980 are that target market. They are the 42 year old. Our research at the McMahon Group shows that the average age of a member joining a club today is 42 years old. And for the next 10 years, we show that that's a, a peak period for those members. And all those members who are 42 years old also have children. And that's a vital part of what's going on today is bringing in those 42 year olds with children. Typically two children are joining with that, with that member. One of the things we see in our survey data over the last 10 years or so is we major, measure satisfaction of clubs across the country of the facilities and amenities that they have. What this chart shows is the very satisfied and satisfied members of the club. And if you note that at the top, those lines in black will show that the under 46 year old member, only 34% of them are very satisfied with their clubs. And if you look to the right, 41% over 46 year olds are very satisfied with their clubs, a disparity of 7%. So what that tells us that the clubs of the past have been geared more towards an older generation and satisfying that older generation. And now we as club managers need to go out there and look at what we need to do to satisfy the member of the future. So the major satisfaction as we see differs by age group and we need to bring that satisfaction level up, especially for those under age 56. Those are the members of today, those are the members of tomorrow, and those are the ones who have children and families utilizing the club. 75% of all new members come from the age group that is under 46 years of age. But looking at that, some of the club's uh, barriers that have discouraged members in the past need to be overcome. And I believe we've done a very good job in the club industry of overcoming there, but we still have a lot of work to do. Our clubs in Florida have done a very good job and appealing to the family, and we're doing a much better job of that going forward. Excessive formality is certainly a thing of the past, and clubs today are seeing their casual dining rooms expand 
greatly. So generally uh, expanding the casual dining, both indoors and outdoors, may, have, may comprise 75 to 80% of all dining that takes place in the clubs today. Lack of, subtle, lack of suitable entertainment options has been one thing that has held people back. And later we'll look at some charts to talk about that. Gender issues hopefully are a thing of the past. We have more women on boards now, more women serving on committees. Obviously there's more women in the workplace, more women executives, and they need a voice at the table and they need to be heard because they are a lot of times make the ones making the buying decisions. They are assisting their husbands and families in making the decisions as to what club to join, when to use the club and what amenities they're going to use at that club. So gender, gender equality is very, very important in what's going on at clubs today. Social programming kind of goes along with those entertainment options. We need to make sure that we have programming for everyone from the small infant for our child care facilities or child watching facilities, all the way through with swim and tennis programs, of course, that are very, very obvious uh, at country clubs today. But we need to make sure that we're entertaining those teenagers, those tween years, that 12 to 16 year old age group that we're not sure what they wanna do or how they wanna utilize the club. We need to look for things for them to do as well. And then on into the adults with options, not only for um, golf, tennis and swimming, but also club activities indoors, whether it be painting classes, wine tasting classes, gourmet classes, beekeeping classes, whatever it may be. But the more opportunity we give members to use the club, the more satisfied they're going to be using the club. Costs are always a factor. If we go back one and stick on that, we'll go look at costs have always been an option or something that members look at. So we need to make sure that we're providing good value for members today. We have to look at the importance of rankings of, of what's going on in clubs today. And if we look at this, we have, we've had, again, our database of clubs around the country shows the importance of members utilizing and joining clubs today. And number one, the number one rating of importance of all clubs is clubhouse facilities. So we need to make sure our clubhouse facilities are up to speed. If you see there, 95% of all members say that that's very important of what's going on at the clubs. So the 45 year olds and under and over 45 are very close there, both of them in the 92, 93% range. The same with dining. So clubhouse facilities and dining are vitally important and they actually outrank golf as far as the importance of club facilities today. A big disparity we see right here is in social activities, very important to those under 45 years of age not quite as important to those over 45, but we really need to gear our social programs and everything to that younger demographic as well, or at least have adequate programs for them. Private parties are, are pretty neutral in that regard. The next one is kind of interesting, both young and old, and that's in the golf category. And while golf is very, very important to club members today, the golf practice facilities are even more important. Today with the work from home mentality that a lot of people have, it's easy for members to get away from work at home and run out to the club, but maybe they don't have four hours or five hours to play golf. They only want to go out there and practice, whether it's chipping and putting or using a short game facility, or maybe even uh, a practice putting uh, um, course or a driving range. We've got some examples of some clubs here in Florida who've done some great jobs. So we'll look at IBIS. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking ahead in a second. Um, but then we go on to tennis. Again, the disparity between tennis and uh, uh, those over 45 and under 55 from 56% satisfied or being very important to the older group is not quite as important. Paddle tennis, of course, that's more popular up north. It's very important to those under 45. And we're just starting to gather data on pickleball. And while the seniors have certainly embraced pickleball, we see younger members really coming out, especially the competitive younger members, and especially the younger competitive golf members come out and are really using pickleball. So we're gonna add some data to that as we go along, but that's an important part of what's happening with the younger generation. And of course, swimming and children's activities are the biggest thing that those under 45 years old are, are looking for. Social activities, again, it's, a, it's vitally important to those, tennis, paddle tennis, swimming, children's activities. Those are the greatest disparities we see between that younger generation and older generation. So it's incumbent upon all of the general managers out there and, and staff members of the club to make sure we have adequate um, services, amenities, and staffing for all age ranges. But again, we need to focus on that younger demographic who's joining clubs today. And it's not only clubs up north, but also some of these Southern clubs, clubs that are gated communities that may have been built for seniors now have younger members and younger families joining them. 
I was at the uh, Plantation Club in Ponte Vedra last week and uh, uh, Jody Clore, the general manager there was telling me that now they have a school bus coming through the community to pick up, pick up children. And it was something that was unheard of 10 years ago because there were absolutely no children in the community. Now they have over 200. So more and more young people are moving into these communities. Speaking of golf facilities, as we did earlier, here's a great example of what IBIS has done um, with their driving range. They have a, uh, a design by Jack Nicholas and his company. They have an X-shaped driving range for multiple shops. They have uh, driving ranges on both ends of the facility hitting towards the middle. And they have targets at various places throughout there. So uh, no matter where you are, you can hit to your target. And at each hitting station, at each hitting bay, there's a digital device that tells where each target is in the yardages. So no matter where those uh, targets are moved or where the tees are moved, that digital readout, or GPS system will tell you what that target line is. So it's improved, uh, improving that situation. They have iPhone stands at every hitting station for the technology there. Top tracer technology is utilized. Of course, they have mirrors, uh, swing plane boards, striking station at both ends of the driving range to make it a true practice facility for everyone to improve their games. The next slide shows uh, what they've done. They have artificial surfaces to help on the maintenance side. So those putting greens are all artificial. The bunkers are actually fabric. So there's, uh, again, less maintenance there. And one of the things they've introduced at IBIS is a robotic ball picker. So they don't have to have a staff member out there. So they actually have robotic ball pickers. They're able to go along the terrain and gather all that up and they're electric. So it's a better way. It's much safer for the environment and uh, better for the staff as well. Boca West Country Club is always on the cutting edge of things that are going on in the world today. and what Matt Lindemans and his team decided there was they looked at what was going on and they have a restaurant there called Mr. D's named after our beloved Jay DiPietro. Um, and then we'll go back one so I can take a look at that if we can. Go back a slide, please. Um, they found that they had only about 100 low handicap golfers, but they had 1,700 people who actually wanted to get out and utilize the golf course. So they wanted to expand their social experience. They had a very small driving range didn't have much space. So they converted the uh, Mr. D's into kind of this top golf experience or top golf like experience, if you will. But they use something called in range radar, which doesn't require lighting. It can still be used at night. They cannot have lights on the driving range because they have so many members that live close to the driving range and the lighting would be disruptive. So this in range is a new system that requires radar rather than, uh, rather than need lights. So that's something that some of you might want to take a look at if you have uh, members that live close to your driving range and want to put up these hitting stations. The next slide does show again, what takes place there. They've got the overhead uh, TV so that people can gather around behind there, have social hour, cocktails, dinner, whatever it may be, hors d'oeuvres, and members can reserve those and, and come out for an hour or so and spend some time and have contests with each other, bring the family members out and turn it into a real fun activity. What we're seeing with simulators is taking place not only at clubs, but at uh, high-end resorts as well. Here's the Four Seasons in Houston. They don't have a golf course, but they certainly have indoor golf capabilities. The other things we see is city clubs around the country have introduced simulators. They don't have golf courses, but um, like New York Athletic Club, Milwaukee Athletic Club, not only do they have simulators, they actually have employed golf professionals to take care of their members and give lessons so that they don't have to run out to the countryside and come out to our country clubs to play. Here's a public facility called the Bunker. Um, it's just a great example of having fun, build in a bar and fun entertainment area alongside the simulators. And today's simulators don't have to be about golf. They can also have children's games in there. So you can play softball, baseball, lacrosse, soccer, whatever it may be. So you can turn these into fun game nights for kids, um, make those simulators into something fun for the kids. The parents can go out to dinner and the kids can be there enjoying activities and, and having some snacks and fun. Another thing, here's a Washington Golf and Country Club outside of DC, and they have the top tracer technology at every hitting station there. So technology has really taken a, a, a strong um, stance in today's field of golf. But golf is not uh, the only thing that goes on out there. The thing that we've seen growing, especially in Florida, out, indoor outdoor dining, Addison Reserve uh, is a great example of that. Michael McCarthy and his team have done a wonderful job. You see that large picture on the left, the indoor outdoor bar to the left is indoor dining and then to the right 
is outdoor dining in the, in the cocktail area and bar scene. And then they have scenes on the right hand side of really bringing that outdoor experience in and the indoor experience out. And more and more we're seeing this, not just in Florida, but around the country. One of the most requested things we're seeing is the, are those indoor outdoor facilities and more nano walls bringing nature into the dining rooms. Another great example of something happening in Florida are uh, expanding pools so that they're family friendly all the way around. Interlocking in Orlando did a great job. They have all the amenities there. They have the, the beach entry or the zero entry kind of on the far left that combined with the splash pad and the kids fun activities there. We see more clubs going away with children's pools or kiddie pools. They're not real safe. They're not real, they can be dangerous at times, but that zero beach entry is uh, a great way to go. Uh, parents love it too, because they can sit there and play with the kids in that zero entry. And then they've got the lap lanes as well. And it's all tied together with indoor outdoor food and beverage that surrounds the pool there. Um, again, just a great example of what's taking place. Uh, here in Scioto uh, Country Club in Columbus, Ohio, they had a 4,000 square foot fitness facility. They needed a larger one. So they expanded and built a new facility of 12,000 square feet, but they took the 4,000 square feet and turned it into multi-generational space with ping pong pool, video games and gaming consoles. The average age of the gamer today is 32 years old. Uh, Greg Wolf, the general manager there tells me he goes over there in the afternoon and he'll see the adults, a bunch of guys sitting around at the gaming consoles or playing pool or ping pong or whatever it is when the kids aren't there. So again, something for all ages to utilize. Kids are very important in what goes on today um, in all ages of the community. So even the gated communities that were built for seniors or older members, we need to accommodate their children and their grandchildren. So nice friendly children's spaces like this and attended activities where we can have a place for children while parents and grandparents go to dinner or play golf or play tennis are a very important part of what's going on in the world today and certainly need to be considered. There's a shot of Mediterra. Bocce is another example of some great things that are happening, kind of a low impact sport. It's a great sport. You can play with what drink in one hand and play in the other. Socialization, getting people together. So you really have a totally different uh, focal point of, of getting people together for that cocktail hors d'oeuvre, happy hour kind of thing. And bocce courts don't take up a lot of space and aren't very expensive. And in some cases, just having them close to the clubhouse is a great way to go. Of course, all this can't be done without a roadmap. So a roadmap to success starts with some strategic planning and put, providing a mission statement. So I'd like to turn it over to my associate, Chris Coulter, to talk about strategic planning and the roadmap to the future. Well, thanks very much, Kevin, and, and, and greetings, everybody. It's, uh, it's great to be virtually in Florida. Bill and I come to you from uh, uh, Omaha, Nebraska, and Kevin, I think you're up in New York. Um, so it's so we, we, uh, we're, we're thrilled to be here. It'd be nicer to be in Florida than Omaha, but that's okay. Um, so yeah, we're thrilled to be here. And, and obviously one of the key, I, I would say that the, the key part of, of this process is really the strategic plan. You know, it's important to have, um, and we can go ahead on to the next slide, Chris, would be great, is, is that, you know, the facilities are one thing, but what's most important before we even start is really to understand what type of club we want to be whether that's in five years, 10 years, but down the road. And, and there's three key pieces um, that are a part of determining that and, and need to be a part of it. And before we can put one shovel in the ground, one pencil to paper, we need to have a strategic plan. Um, let's go back a little bit. Let me just go through those three, three points first. Um, you know, we need effective leadership. And that leadership is not just the board, but it's a board that is um, eager to find out what, what the membership is looking for. That leadership is in partnership with you, the general manager, and your senior leadership. It's engaging programs uh, and it's relevant facilities. Just a real quick story about the importance of the engaging programs. You know, Kevin and I were at two, two clubs this past week um, and a, a dichotomy of their view. Actually, Kevin was one, I was with, with one with Bill. We were at a club in Ohio uh, and their programming consisted of, they knew they needed casual dining. And the board member said, well, all we got to do is put up a TV and serve spaghetti. That, that's their, that was their idea of casual dining. Whereas Bill and I were at a club, and again, before they've done any facility planning, uh, they know they need casual dining. They need a multi-general re recreation place. And they're spending the time to put the programming together before they, they do anything, before they understand what the facilities are. 
So first, before we even, even start, is we need to know what type of club we are and what we want to be. And with that, what, what's most important is, with that effective leadership is we need alignment. So many times we go to, to clubs, and I'm sure you as managers and, and senior leadership in your club understand that, that if the board's not aligned, not only aligned with each other, but aligned with management and understanding what is our vision, what is our mission, who are we, um, then you're not going to go anywhere. And the strategic plan really helps create that alignment. So what is strategic planning? You know, we, we, we go to so many clubs and, and, you know, boards, it's interesting, most boards, the, the folks that are on boards have been successful in their own businesses, and most of them have done strategic planning and they think they understand it. We feel that this definition really helps um, kind of set the tone for what needs to be done at the club. And just, it's so important, let me just read it here. Strategic planning, it's a process in which organizational leaders determine their vision for the future, as well as identify their goals and objectives for the organization. The process includes establishing the sequence in which those goals should fall so that the organization is enabled to reach its stated vision. So, you know, it's, it's setting the goals. We're going to talk about goals here in, in a minute. But in, if we don't have a strategic plan, we cannot get to what our vision and what our mission is. And why is the strategic uh, plan important to your club? It provides a sense of direction and outlines measurable goals. You know, we would, we would tell you that, that the strategic plan is just as, if not more important for the management team as it is for the board. Um, it's a tool that is useful in guiding day-to-day -day decisions. You as managers come in each day and you, you know, what are we here for? What's our plan? What are we trying to reach? You know, you, you as the general manager and senior leadership and the, and, and the folks that work for you, they want to know what are we striving for? What are our goals? How do we get measured? What, how do we know if we're doing a good job? And it's by having those goals, setting those goals, setting measurable um, points in each of them, you know what progress we're taking. And you know that with, with your strategic plan, which before we said is a process, not um, an event. The, the strategic plan is not just meeting once, putting a strategic plan together and being done. Each day we're measuring it. How are we doing it um, with your board? Strategic planning, um, the goal should be the first thing on your agenda. So each month the board is looking at how are we doing in our plan? Are we meeting our goals? And the same thing with your staff meetings and your senior leadership meetings. Are we meeting those goals? Do we need to adjust what was number one, what was number two, and, and be flexible so that you're moving forward? The strategic plan really is the roadmap to the future. Um, I'm sure that you've all sat in meetings where um, if you don't have a strategic plan, the board sits around and comes up with ideas. Okay, what, what's most important now? And typically you're looking at things that are in the rear view mirror. How did, how did things go before? There's a great line from um, Alice in Wonderland written by Lewis Carroll that says, if you don't know where you're going, any road will, will get you there. And I'm sure you've seen this is that, that if the board and the club does not have a strategic plan, you're all over the place and just going down different paths. And a lot of times you come back to where you started. Um, we find that there are really uh, nine important strategic goals to, for clubs. Um, these are not in an order of importance. And, and honestly, with each club, some are more important than others and, and, and put in a, in a sequence based on what the club's needs are. There's governance. Um, you know, you have you best practices and what your governance is, the right side of the board or their job descriptions, board orientation, facilities, which Bill is going to talk to you about here in a minute, membership, what is the right number of members uh, for a club. A lot of, you know, through this um, post-pandemic, as clubs have grown beyond their wildest dreams, you know, we find out, you know, what's, what's our membership number? What's the right number? In our bylaws, it says 500 members. Is that the right, mem right membership number for the club? Look at finance, you, you know, are you, are you funding depreciation? Do we have reserves? Uh, what's our goal with our financing program? Communications, probably one of the most important pieces of goals is making sure that we are providing a two-way communication with the membership. Do they have an opportunity to be providing feedback and that you know what they're saying through survey work or just open lines of communication, but making sure that the, that the membership understands what the plan is for the future and the communicating and what are the, the right venues and and avenues for, for communicating to the members. Management, um, do we have a succession plan? One of the things that you never heard of before, but as clubs um, uh, create 
and managers create their management team? Do we have a plan moving forward um, as we succeed as, as their succession in that successful um, management? Employees, um, one of the goals that we see more and more now, especially with the challenge of the labor market, is being in the employer of choice. How do we attract employees? How do we provide uh, and, and give them the same sense of quality experience at the club as we do for our members? Our food and beverage program is a goal. Uh, all of our recreation, golf, aquatics, radic rackets, and wellness. And then what ties it all together and really the foundation of everything is the programming we have for the club. Uh, you know, the strategic management process, uh, there's really two levels of this. When we come in and do a strategic planning uh, retreat with the club, it all starts with the mission. We're going to be talking about that here in just a, a minute. But the mission really drives what our strategic plan is. Every decision that the board makes, every decision that you as leaders um, and management of your club make should be driven by the mission. From the mission, we have our vision, which is aspirational, the values. What do we live by each day? Um, the, probably the most important piece of developing the strategic plan uh, and create alignment with the board is the SWOT analysis, which you, I'm sure you've all done, but it really helps understand and align the board and what are our strengths, our weaknesses, our opportunities and threats. And that really helps align the board. I would also say that as we look at the strategic plan for board and general manager, uh, we do work with clubs where they have a separate strategic planning committee, but we would tell you that really the strategic planning committee should be the board. They're the ones that need to own it, verbalize it, communicate it to the membership. So they should really be a part um, of, of developing the strategic plan. From that SWOT analysis, we develop what our strategic issues are, what are those challenges, and those, and which creates the goals that we need to set, and our action plans and our strategies of how we're going to achieve those goals. From there, we move on to that the, the process involving management and their uh, team. This is really what helps you as a manager and your team understand what are our objectives and, and action steps. We now move, and hopefully you all have this, where your board has set this strategic plan and they're looking at the club strategically and they're stepping away from the day-to-day -day operations. And hopefully there probably aren't many clubs listening today that have boards that are uh, uh, bogged down in the minutia of, of operations. Um, but you have now have objectives and action steps that you can move on with these goals. You can develop schedules, you can talk to the board and let them know what are our resources that we need to achieve these goals. Uh, it provides accountability so the, that you're, you as a manager, you and your team are being held accountable and you know what your responsibilities are. And then you're continuously evaluating, are we achieving these goals, whether that's monthly, yearly, and as your strategic plan looks out over five years. And we would tell you that it, every five years, you should be refreshing. You should be refreshing every year to adjust the goals that you have. But every five years, redoing this process um, because new goals will, will come into play as the, the strategic plan changes and as the demographics and needs and wants of your membership change. For any club, uh, we need to have a clear mission and vision. Uh, we all have a target of where we need to go to and without that mission and vision, we are not gonna be able to hit that target. The mission and vision and values um, are defined in, in, in three different ways. So our mission is really, why does the club exist? Um, you know, so many times we sit with a board and um, if there's 12 people around the board and we ask the question of what is the mission, you know, usually they all look at each other and then ask the manager, what is our mission? Um, and that's, you know, you, you would never see that in their own business. So we really need to first understand why does the club exist? Our vision is what do we aspire to be? Who do we want to be when we grow up? And the values for each club are what is that unique feel, that behavior, that traits that are, that are unique to us at our club? So what is your mission? What is your vision? This is one of my favorite stories and, and uh, I probably should let Kevin Carroll tell it. He's heard it so many times with, with being with me, but I think it really illustrates the importance of a mission, a vision, and why it's important to our employees. Uh, back in, in uh, 1960, when, when John F. Kennedy became president, he had a vision and his vision was to be the first to put a man on the moon. So the vision, there was the aspiration. He aspired to have not only to put someone on the moon, but to be the first to ever put somebody on the moon. We were in the middle of the Cold War and we wanted to certainly uh, beat out the Soviet Union in, in doing this. So that was his mission. So what was the, uh, that was the vision. So what was the mission? 
The mission was to develop a, a rocket, find the right people, build it, and be able to, to do that. So they created something called NASA, right? And so uh, when NASA was in the early stages of, of trying to achieve this mission, um, President Kennedy uh, toured um, the NASA facilities and he ran into a guy that was outside the men's room mopping the floor. And he went up to him, and made small talk, and he said to him, you know, um, hi, I'm John F. Kennedy. Uh, uh, what are you doing? And the, the, the fellow that was obviously the custodian said, I'm help, helping put a man on the moon. And that goes to, to really explaining that every single employee, when they walk into your club every day, they should feel like they're a part of the mission whether they're the greeter at the door, the person answering the phone, the golf professional, the server, they know what your mission is. And that's what's most important. The mission should really answer four questions. It's amazing how many clubs don't have a mission statement. And again, as I said earlier, every decision that's made at the board, in the boardroom and at the management level should answer these four questions. Who does the club serve? We serve members, golfers, families. Um, we have one club that we're working with now. They actually included their staff and their employees in their mission as part of who they serve. What does the club provide? Uh, depending on the club, do we, do we provide recreation, food and beverage? If you're a yacht club, you provide sailing. Um, depending on which club you are, you can you define what you, what you provide. And at what quality level does the club strive for? Um, we have one club that we're working with the Yacht Club that their, their goal is to be world class. And that, that, that means a lot. There's a lot of commitment there if you're going to be world class. Think about those places that you know are world class. Are you premium? Are you striving for excellence? What is the quality level? With that comes the, the need for investment in dollars. If you're going to be the best, um, that means in staff and everything. You can't be have the highest quality with golf, but mediocre food and beverage or mediocre staffing. And then what makes the club unique, unique and worth belonging to, especially in, the, in this day and age where there's such competition with clubs? What is that factor that really creates something unique about your club? And why do your members want to belong there as opposed to the club down the street? So it's interesting. And, and the first time we ever put a strategic planning together back when I was a manager, the board actually did it kind of in a vacuum. And so it was their mission statement. It wasn't the member's mission statement. It wasn't the staff's mission statement. And I found this statistic pretty easy, uh, pretty interesting, um, that, um, that many mission statements fail to stick. They're often boring. Um, and, and this survey said that 70% of management felt that their employees were inspired by their mission, but only 27% of employees agreed with that. That's why the development of the mission statement is so important that everybody's involved that every day when they walk in, they know what their mission is and what they're trying to achieve. And certainly with the vision statement, uh, the comp coffee cup here is that uh, a, a gentleman I once worked for said, your vision statement should be short, articulate, and it should, you should be able to fit it on a, on a, on a coffee mug. A uh, club that I, was, that I managed in Nantucket, we actually did that. And our vision uh, was, we aspired to be the club of choice on Nantucket. That was it. So in order to do that, we could then develop our mission and things that we had to do to achieve that, that vision. And here's just a couple of examples of some, some visions and missions that I think really stick. Southwest West Airlines, I think we all obviously all know. And I use this as an example because when you think of hospitality and service um, in the airline industry, certainly for me, I think of, of Southwest Airlines. Their vision is to become the world's most loved, most flown, and most profitable airline. That says it all. Those are the things that they are aspiring to be, and here's their mission to do that. They are dedicated to the highest quality. There's, there's the quality level of customer service. What do they deliver? They, they don't deliver you know, travel. They deliver customer service with a sense of warmth, friendliness, individual pride, and company spirit. They are committed to provide our employees with a stable work environment with equal opportunity for learning and personal growth. Not once in there does it say anything about getting somebody from Omaha to Austin, where I'm going today, but it talks about customer service and providing that experience. You know, our, the consumers today are experiential. They want something special, and that's what your members are looking for. And then with a club that we're working for that we, we're proud to say that we helped them, them create this, they, their vision was 
or is our family's second home. I've always said as a manager, we want our, our employees, our members to feel as comfortable in the club as they do in their own home. And that's the vision of this club. And here's their, their, their mission. They wanna be the premier private club experience. Um, we took out their name. Um, this club provides a family oriented social setting devoted to promoting exceptional sport. There's that quality level, dining and social and recreational member experience. Our club is the place to be in Florida with a warm, friendly atmosphere for our family of members and staff. And so you can see where they've pulled that all together and including their staff because they see the staff as part of their family. So now that we've got a, we've got a mission, we've got a vision, we've got a roadmap, now it's time to put that master plan together. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Bill McMahon, uh, the guru of facility planning. Bill? Well, very good. Thank you, Chris. And hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, this is obviously being an architect. This is my fun. I mean, hopefully, hopefully I've done this for the last almost 40 years on my own clubs, uh, country clubs, city clubs in St. Louis, uh, as well as for a couple of thousand clubs across the country. And so let's talk about facility planning in the context of its importance. It's, you know, it's interesting in clubs today, the visualization, the physical visual, you know, visual, visual visitation or vision of the club, its image to the community is two things. It's clubhouse and it's golf course, if you have golf. Uh, it, it's a personification of who the club is. And so when you're looking at that, the clubhouse in the, <clears throat> what I call there in the broader spectrum, of course, it means all the grounds and everything that happens around it, but it is a visualization of what we are and who we are. And so like Chris talked earlier, and go ahead and show the next one. Uh, so it, it talks about having success in clubs is, in all ways is having very satisfied members, not just satisfied, uh, but it, it's the very satisfied member who's motivated, who uses the club, never leaves the club and proposes new members to the club. And one of the most successful ways to have a successful and satisfied membership is to have facilities which personify what the club stands for. If you look at clubs like Wingfoot or Baltus for all these great clubs, great golf clubs, uh, they don't have the most efficient clubhouses. They just have the best clubhouses for that club with traditions and everything expressed in the buildings and their golf training centers, even though these are just great golf clubs. And a funny thing, and always remind everybody that Wingfoot does have a very nice swimming pool. Uh, they don't have tennis courts, but they do have things that affect in their mission uh, not just the golf dimension, but also an expression of family and service back to everyone. So important to know that and to basically understand it. And looking at the next slide, I think the issue here is that to achieve success in clubs, it's a given. It's a given that we have a very good board and we have strong management leadership. Nothing will happen unless that's there. That we'll have good programs and services that we deliver good value for the cost. But then it's the facilities, which basically mean delivering the promise to the membership by having that strategic plan and following that strategic plan, by having that what we call dedicated, what we call visionary board, by having that capable and strong management team to make it happen. Uh, but we got to give them the facilities to do that. And so in the club world, we're trying to work for those outstanding facilities. This to the right is the uh, pool complex for Boca West that we've been involved with and uh, outstanding, you know, 3,500 person community in Boca. Uh, people would ask me, well, why do we need a swimming pool for us older people? It's a little more of a retirement group, as you can imagine. And yet in their mission, they give back to their community and, and to their members and that they have, a, they have a, 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 an importance to give back and to attract their, not only their children, but their grandchildren uh, to the club. And so when they spend $10 million on a facility like this, it has a purpose, even though you might not think that we would want this kind of a pool complex. And actually, it's replacing one that's almost as nice as this, but this one's being brought really up to speed as far as the new things are concerned in the club and aquatic world. So obviously, focusing on outstanding facilities is important because it's basically saying we understand and we deliver in all the other ways, and therefore, we can provide the facilities because we, we know where we're going and we know who we're serving. And looking at also in that attracting of members, you'll find in general manners all across the country will say the most single effective way to attract and retain members is to have good facilities that basically are relative to what people need. And so when we go into a club that has rundown facilities, you know you got all kinds of problems. You got a board that's probably asleep. You've got management team 
for whatever reason can't execute their, their ability. Um, you could most likely for surely find that they're underfunded. They don't like a benchmarking does. They are not reinvesting in their facilities. And you'll see those clubs on a slow slope to, to disintegration. I have two right now I'm working with that are still, uh, I think that it's an all male world, um, stressing all for the male and not for anyone else. And what do you think is happening? They can't afford general managers. They're heavily in debt. Uh, they have they have no mission basically that they may, other than a mission that's outdated and the club continues to decline. Ultimately, it'll be owned by someone else or it'll be a housing project. And so this issue of having proper facilities and development is absolutely critical uh, to, to make that happen. In looking at the challenge, of course, in improvements is obviously, uh, you, you'll always hear, you know, and, and this happens more often than not, it's kind of scary. We need improved facilities. So everybody on the board is a free for all as to what we add, what we do. Just hire an architect and start building. And without a strategic plan, that's the best way to throw away millions of dollars because we see the poorly conceived projects with special interest groups get built um, with about 50% effectiveness where with a strategic plan guiding the program, they could have 100% effectiveness. And once we basically borrow that money, those million dollar bills and have to pay them off, let's say over 10 years, the, the deed is done, you're, you're strapped. You, you, you've actually uh, you know, shot your gun off and there's nothing left at that point to do and you just have to live with your facilities. The idea too, is again, uh, and I get more often than not, we get invited into clubs that have finished their facility plan and come to McMahon because we're supposed to know a lot about facilities and say basically, uh, 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 can we develop a strategic plan now? And uh, it's sort of interest in, in while the special interest groups have got their plans through, there's that gnawing feeling that when they built first before they acted uh, on, and, and, know, and knew where they were going, they end up with some lot of mistakes. And so, so it's an issue that you really want to avoid. Get that plan done first in those membership surveys so we know what members want. And we also basically have a strategy of prioritizing what's most in, and what's not most important. Uh, it, obviously, the typical backward things that we see is that in today's world, uh, we still have golf is our primary activity in clubs, but of course, golf is full. And there are really no, no additional golf memberships that we can hold in the clubs. And in fact, we're being asked now to how do we get rid of some golfing members? And so our ability to attract more dues paying members is not continual investments in golf courses that are already in very good shape. Um, and you get no return on investment with that. Uh, so is it as an effect, you know, it's a non-golf facility is where the growth is in the club industry today, even though golf is wildly popular coming in after the pandemic, because we don't have any more space for any more golf. The other one, of course, is the old classic, which we're slowly getting out of it, is, uh, but more formal dining rooms. Uh, you know, uh, you'll get an older guard on the board that basically come to continually enhance the upscale dining when everybody is going to the very casual outdoor dining. Um, and again, you end up with these white elephant rooms. The, you, know, you can spend an easy half a million dollars on one of these types of rooms and nobody uses it. And so it, it, it's an example, again, of being focused and doing and using the strategic plan as your leadership event. In looking at obviously the issues of, of successful facility planning that we use now, and at McMahon, we almost, without, without fail now, we're saying to all our clients is, unless you have the, the strategic plan first, you shouldn't do your facility planning. It just, it, it's a big wasted effort. Christian, Claire, and I were just at a club up in the Boston area uh, over the past weekend, and it was interesting that it's a club we tried to do. We did a survey for them that clearly identified what the members wanted. Uh, and then the board took the decision that they could just move forward with the project and didn't have to go through strategic planning. And so for a year, we were a cat chasing our tail trying to get them to decide who they wanted and where they wanted different facilities. And we just got them to realize that unless we have that strategic plan, we cannot develop a good successful master plan or facility plan. And so over last weekend, we had an aha moment with that board as we took them through this. And as they got through the strategic plan, now everybody knows where it all goes. We know where it fits together. There's a, now we can move forward with a project. And so obviously the first and foremost thing is, you know, board and manager work together with them, develop strategic plan. It's the board's responsibility to develop the strategic plan not a special committee, it's because if the board doesn't develop the plan, the board will not implement the plan. So one in item one is board and manager have a strategic plan with an outside consultant like ourselves to guide it. Doesn't take, takes about two months to do it, not a big issue. 
And then from that point, we need to involve the members in a survey and get that buy-in for them. And we've been doing surveys for clubs for, well, for the whole 39 years that we've been in business. And we have really perfected that product down to the point of knowing exactly what to ask. And every club is different as to what's most important. But the important thing here is that that survey gets buy-in and we can compare results to the national database from clubs all over the country and regionally on what scores you should be getting and what scores you are getting. It could be on food and beverage, it could be on facilities, it could be on the golf course, all those types of things we get that buy-in. And then in item th step three, we're in the position with strategic plan in place, the membership survey results available. We sit down with a planning committee of members to develop the master plan. And then from the master plan, we're able to identify the highest priority improvements from the survey of the membership and propose projects to members that are affordable and that are very winnable. And uh, Chris and I just did one last night at a club here, the Field Club in Omaha, just a great club, um, very reasonably priced and stuff like that. A tremendous membership that basically five years ago, they were around 200, or excuse me, about 600 members. And today there are 800 members filled in all capacities with great management and a really a visionary board, all following the process basically of doing it successfully rather than doing it by guessing as to what's best. So it, go ahead, Chris and change. This is just a little bit of the stuff that we're doing uh, for the, the, the different marketplace in Florida. This is the Wilderness uh, Golf Club down in Naples where they have, the, if you can see on the screen, this is an, the exact presentation we made about a year plus ago showing the uh, existing clubhouse in red and then basically showing the new one. And then this is the floor plan showing it and stuff like that. But what it is, is it, these plans are sort of cartoonish, but they're all in scale. And a, and a lay person can look at them and understand where the kitchen is, where the ballroom, how it relates to the golf course, entry areas, where the tennis courts are and that. And then to that, we had some, some what we call some pretty pictures here of, of a kind of a rustic Florida style you know, here, as opposed to what they have. We, when we go to a new clubhouse, which is only about 3% of our a couple thousand projects are new, it's sort of interesting. Uh, the rationale, of course, is most of our clubhouses are adaptable. Th this one, this existing clubhouse, though, had a basement in Florida, which isn't really too advisable in every hurricane and floods. Uh, obviously, that's not going to, you know, you get all kinds of problems with that. But this is the kind of information that conceptually, here's the indoor bar area, conceptually showing members what it could look like, what it will look like. Um, when we're getting a project approved. This is another rendering here, that, that what we call a site plan of the uh, club at Somerset Plantation, in Fort Myers, Florida, where this is a gated community of about a thousand homes. They have a separate private golf club. And this is a good example of, of a community being built by a Pro Brothers or one of those majors um, that puts a pool together, but puts no snack bar or food at the pool. So nobody uses it, you know. You put the food, you put the food and the drink and stuff there, and all of a sudden the place goes crazy with activity. So strategically, we work with this board to develop the. This is an aerial photograph here, aerial rendering showing how the whole thing fits together around an existing building, and that pool, which is sort of a lake-like pool, um, the same pool they have today. But when we add some amenities, and we added pickleball on the left-hand lower left-hand corner, um, improved the tennis. Um, and expanded the fitness facility, all of a sudden it just takes off in a wild way, but it's all based upon a strategic plan and a membership survey that members told us what to do. This is the, this is the proposed uh, dining area with the bar to the right that's being built. Uh, actually, it's all existing building. We're just basically re re you know, restructuring and re you know, repositioning everything. I mean, these are the kind of drawings and stuff that are done. This is Club Pelican Bay. This is Dave Mangan's club in Naples, um, an outstanding facility. Uh, it's sort of, sort of interesting here. This is on a $25 million project that now would probably cost you perhaps close to $45 million to build five years later. Uh, you can see the new dining social edition and on the, on the kind of flesh colored and the one on the right uh, are basically improvements that we did. And it was so successful that, that the light colored, we'll call the existing locker room building, we raised an extra $6 million in entry fees and built that too and replaced it. So these are the kind of what we call conceptual drawings that communicate a strategic plan and, and what we would call a master plan to the members in getting their approval. Go ahead, Shane. And these are the kind of renderings that we did to sell the project, but you can kind of see what it is and the different dining areas, the lakes and stuff. And then the next slide. 
is based on how they built it. And so you can see that this we proposed a little more traditional feel, but the interior designer and the architects that did the work did an outstanding job, a little more upbeat, a little more trendy, and that really came out of the project. And the members love it from the viewpoint of use and things like that that are outstanding. Here's the outdoor view, lower right-hand corners of what the building looks like today and stuff like that. A very talented architectural firm in the uh, Naples area worked with us on this. And as I said, McMahon, we set the concepts up and get the projects approved. The local firms basically execute those firms, those projects. Go ahead. And that's basically it. So what I'd like to do in the, at this point is turn it back to Kevin and open it up for questions. Kevin, it's all yours. Great. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate that. And uh, again, thanks everyone for being here today. Um, we had some people send in some questions and I'll ask Beth if she would uh, read some of those and we'll see if we can answer them for you. Okay, thank you. Um, the first question we had um, was at, at Florida Clubs, what do you see the most asked for facility improvement or additions? What's the newest, greatest thing that people are looking for? Yeah, great question. And you know, Bill went through some of that. It kind of depends on the club and where they are in their facilities because we see pickleball, of course, is growing everywhere. The indoor, outdoor dining is certainly taking place everywhere. Um, Bill, what, what do you see? You've done a lot of clubs here in Florida in the last several years. Well, you know, obviously what's happened after the pandemic, anything outdoors is wildly successful. And uh, e even in the North Country, Minnesota and stuff like that, in areas that we're working with in Wisconsin, it is because of the health issue, but it just, we just accepted that. It feels good to do that. Uh, casual dining, the more casual, the more usage. Uh, the, what you're trying to do is complement uh, a broader non-golf dimension. So wellness fitness continues to expand. These are the, these are the areas that, uh, we, if you build a wellness fitness facility, and then you should integrate in a golf training and conditioning aspect if you have golf, these are the areas that people are looking for for growth and, and for usage. Remembering that the, the golf is full. You can't get any more golfers in on the golf course. And so if you're going to attract members and retain them, you have to basically offer more than a golf experience. Great. Thank you. Our next question is from uh, Matt Tornow from the Moorings Club, and he is asking, we're building an indoor-outdoor bar next spring at the Moorings Golf and Country Club in Naples. Besides renderings for members and a town hall meeting, what are some of the other ideas to inform the membership about the project? Well, you, you know, it's interesting when you the indoor outdoor bar kind of challenges people is will it work? And the issue of course it can because in, in good weather, you can open it up so that it works both ways in the shoulder seasons in the winter, even in Florida, it can be chilly, windy, et cetera. You can shut that area off. Um, but you wanna make that bar that a bar is a real hub of, of what we call social activity in a club. And so when you can go the indoor outdoor, I think Gray Oaks has a great one. I think down in Naples and stuff like that. These are the kinds of things that attract people. Uh, and remember a club's purpose is to bring people together. So anything that does that, I mean, a swimming pool, wellness, fitness areas and bars are the most effective for bringing members together. And so the more innovative and successful we can be with these kinds of activities, the more you achieve the social purpose of club, which is basically building friendships. Yeah, and I think also for Matt, um, the, some other ideas would be that we've seen that are successful. Obviously, storyboards in the clubhouse, uh, a brochure that in, in a form of a flip book that can be mailed out that tells the story from start to finish. The other important thing is we would tell you that the, the facility planning committee um, that's involved with the master planning process really is a marketing committee. So you want to include members and get them excited about it that are really well respected throughout the club so that they're having kind of living room chats with a half a dozen or a dozen members at a time. And, and really from a grassroots, you know, you tell what's like that old commissioner, commit, uh, old commercial. I told one who told another, who told another, who told another. So really it's, it's getting the message out in, in small bits. Yeah. The other thing, you know, Chris too, is they go out and visit the other clubs and they're all over Florida that have them, get people to see what's out there. You know, it, it, you can, once you see it and experience, you'll understand why your club should have it. Great. There you Great. Go. Thank you so much. Um, just a statement. Um, uh, David Dorr Smith is asking when this recording will be available. Uh, David, that will be available in the, in case you missed it, um, communication that goes out every Friday. So you'll have that by Friday. 
Um, John Spies is at, asking the question, how is the best way to do a plan and phases over a couple of years to make it affordable for membership to implement? Well, you know, when you're, this is Bill again, and uh, the important aspect on phasing, we develop a master plan, let's say it's a $10 million for everything we want. And you have to though, take it in phases as members can afford it. And by that, I mean, we see in the industry that you can gen we can generally raise if the survey shows there's a need for it and support for a project, something between 10 and 20% of your operating dues as a capital dues line that would fund the project. And so if you look at your members, if I have a, a thousand members, you know, obviously I have a lot more leverage. I can do a lot more project uh, rather than if I have 500. But the idea is it has to be built around an affordable funding mechanism that ultimately lets you phase it over time. But each phase has to stay within that affordable range. And so if you had dues of, let's say, $1,000 a month, we would normally tell you we could raise about $100. That's 10% of that a month. And that $100 as capital dues would actually go to the bank and borrow $10,000. And if we had 500 members, we could do a $5 million capital project if it's the things that the members support in the survey and if it's part of the master plan that, or part of the strategic plan that you can justify it. And that's, and that's about your issue. If you try to go for, uh, let's say you need, you'd like to build 10 million, but my strategy shows only 5 million, you go for the 10, you won't get it. Uh, they'll, they'll want the plan, but they will not give you that much money. And so if you want to be successful and get what we always call at least a 60, 40 percent win on voting, because we almost have to vote every project, uh, you stay within a reasonable funding limit, but, but have the master plan as your ultimate goal. So you'll ultimately get there. Uh, if you're like the club we just did here yesterday, the field club here, you know, in the five years, they gained 200 members. Can you imagine how that has helped them from a dues line and capital dues? So, and that's only because they have a very active program of improving golf, improving what they call clubhouse, improving the swimming pool. <clears throat> so they built that support in the community. Thank you very much. Um, the next question, question is from Hans Grover. Um, he's saying, at what point in the process would a club reach out to a firm like yours? Strategic plan is done. Should a master facility plan be completed first? Thank you. Yeah, I think, you, you know, um, uh, oh, go ahead, Kevin. No, I was going to say, that's what we see in the industry. Once a strategic plan is done, we want to make sure that a strategic facility plan is part of the overall strategic plan. And that's where we come in, or a firm like ours or a firm like ours, we'll come in and do a master plan and work with a planning committee that is appointed by the board. And typically we see a planning committee being a, a group of 12 individuals, 12 members of the club, four board members, and then eight members at large. And we want those members at large to represent various demographic groups, various ages, genders, uh, different uses of the clubs. And then we ask that that committee not have any architects, interior designers, or contractors as part of that firm. We don't want people to come in with preconceived notions trying to solve the problem or trying to solve the issue before we go through the process. Chris, you were going to say? Yeah, no, I was, I was just going to add, Kevin, I think it's important. You know, the key to this, I talked this about in strategic planning. The key to the success of all this is the communication. It's involving the membership from the very beginning. It's making sure that they understand what you're doing. Developing a master plan doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna build it all at once or that you're spending the members money, but members will be excited and respectful the fact that the club is taking the initiative and being proactive to think forward. You've asked the members what they're, now that you've got a strategic plan, have we surveyed the members? Do we understand, have we tested those things within the survey that we think the members want? There's a whole process and, and again, you know, we, we are happy to, uh, Beth, we'll certainly provide, you know, some of our information to whomever is interested to understand that, that five-step process. You know, you know, another thing that's sort of interesting in doing this for so many years is that most clubs don't strategic plan or just do surveys to do surveys. They, they find they have a need to accomplish something. It could be operational, could be membership in the old days when we didn't have enough members, uh, or, it had, or a major facility thing they want to do, and they don't know how to go about it. That's when they get religion that we need a strategic plan and a survey to solve a problem. But they don't just do a strategic plan and think, gee, what, what, what could we do? You know, no, they, they, the leadership of the club knows there's a need to do something and they're looking for a process to get it accomplished. And that's why, that's why you do the strategic plan first to bring some what we call unity, everybody together 
on solving a problem. And then we work on the master planning side to actually make the physical improvements to, to accomplish that plan. Uh, Beth, let me jump in here. I, I know that we've used an hour and we're happy to stay on and answer some more questions. I know there's more in the chat room, but for those who only budget an hour's time, I want to give the code today for the, for the uh, seminar is satisfy. Satisfy with a capital S is the code. So you can use that. And if Beth, I guess, can we stay on or if we want to answer some more questions? Certainly for those that want to stay on, we still have 51 on, um, which was which was our number right at 11 o'clock. So for those that want to stay on, absolutely. If you have the time, we'll answer. We, I think we have three or four more questions. Um, that and, and, and Beth, also, if we don't get to all of them, please just, um, we can either copy them down from the chat room, but between the three of us, we'll make sure that we answer all the questions if we run out of time here. Super. The next question in then, then is from David Maine. If you were to make a broad sweeping master plan change to the property, how far out in years would you begin that planning? Well, you know, it's interesting. When I look at, when, we, at McMahon, when we're doing our, and we do a lot of master planning, <clears throat> we look at probably a 20 year vision to the future. Now that's, that's, that's a bit out there and you might say, but what that is, is this, is that we need a long range direction for our facility improvements. And we want to accomplish it within some reasonable period of time. Uh, it's, you know, the old green banana syndrome. And, uh, and, and so the issue here is if we're, they want to do a project right now, they want to do improvements with this master plan. We used to divide it in two basic phases. One is a project phase we'll probably do in the next year and, and get it to the membership and get it approved having the master. And then 10 years out, we'll probably, there'll be another group of people in the room doing another plan, doing the finishing that master plan so at 11 years out, you've actually finished your, and that goes for another 10 years. So the vision for us for a, for a master plan is usually a 20 year vision out, but it's actually done in two 10 year, it's done immediately and then 10 years later. And that's what's happening. We find these major projects are on a 10 year cycle. Uh, and people don't want to, people don't mind uh, being inconvenienced once and paying for it. And then they just want to enjoy it for 10 years. And then there'll be a new group with a new wrinkle, a new itch to do things and then they'll do that. And so our master plan wants to cover that 20 year vision in facility improvements. And that second phase may actually change. Oh yeah, yeah. good. I think it's also important to note that when you do that master plan and you, you start that planning process and communicate it to the membership, it gets the members excited as well. And that's certainly um, good for the members and also good to attract new members to see that you're forward thinking, continuing to reinvest in the facilities of the club and we're not gonna get stagnant. We're not going to let our facilities stagnate, but we're always gonna be fresh and looking good. Well, and the change issue is kind of important too because who would have thought that pickleball would be cannibalizing tennis courts, uh, you know, like it is, you know, you can't believe it. And, and I, I don't know if pickleball can be more popular than tennis, but I tell you, it's, it's much more popular than being built today. Uh, than the tennis was. And unless they reinvigorate tennis some way, we may all be playing pickleball in the future. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you. We have two more questions. Um, David Summers, um, they tried a $14 million project and heard a lot of negative feedback from members. They paused the project. How do you now go back and get a positive vote for a $10 million project that has a smaller scope? Well, I think most importantly, I'll, let, let me just kick off because I've been on the communication mantra. I think that what's most important to David is that, that you're communicating to the members that you've listened to them. Hopefully you've done some focus groups or some opinion surveys of what part of that $14 million project they didn't like. Was it just pricing or was it specific areas? And now you're down to 10 million. The, 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 the good story to tell is we heard you members, we're now at $10 million, which we think is affordable, is to, to, to present that to them to then do a kind of a straw poll afterwards to make sure that they're supporting it. But it's the communication, it's the packaging of that it's you have listened to them, you've heard them, and you as um, effective uh, leadership, both as the board and the management, have come back with that new project. Thank Bill you, or Kevin, I'm not sure if anything else in there, but. Um, yeah, well, yeah, just so you know, many times uh, when we pr propose a project to them, they have a master plan, let's say it's $20 million. And we do our analysis on our funding and we think we can afford 10 million. That, that would be my hundred dollars a month type of thing if we had a thousand members. Uh, and most of the time when we miss it, 
it's because we didn't, pro it's not so much the money aspect, it's the value that they're getting for the money we missed it on. We, 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 and a lot of times this could be a good example is they're, they're improving, continually improving the golf course. It's already in superlative satisfaction level and, and investing in it. And the rest of the members say, well, wait a minute, we can't even play any more golf. Why didn't we fix, why didn't we convert some, why didn't we get some pickleball? Why didn't we expand our other areas? So usually when that's happening, it's, it's like Chris is saying, you have to kind of get back in the members mind. Why did, where did we miss it? Where, it, it could be that it was too expensive, but generally speaking, it's that we didn't do quite the things that they wanted that they saw value in it. And so then you have to adjust the program to basically, uh, that's what, like what we do on a major capital program. We never vote the first time we take a capital program out. We, we do an opinion questionnaire and ask the members in a straw poll, is this what you like? Is this, did we get it right? Are we okay? And from that information, you basically are able then to finalize the presentation. We don't lose projects anymore because in effect, we have voted twice. Uh, and the first time we get a feel for it, and the second time we get it right, what they really want, and the, almost always go through now. So, but, but you have to basically really, check, like you're saying, Kev, and uh, Christian, yeah, Chris, uh, is to get that input at the beginning is so important. Wonderful. Wonderful. On that same type of question, um, how do you address members who don't support the project? Um, David Dor Smith's club just had approved a $17.3 million renovation of the club and outdoor dining. It passed 59 to 41. So how do you address those 40% of the members that are upset and didn't vote for the, pro the project? Now that, that's an important part to, to get the healing process started. And I think one of the early ways to get that healing process started is to make sure that you communicate all through the construction process. As Chris said, communication is very important. Keep communicating through it, but it's really incumbent upon the board, the, the management to make sure that project comes in um, on time and close to budget so you don't feed that negative energy that's already out there. And most of the time when the project goes through and once it's completed, members really turn around. I can't tell you how many times we've had a project and had a member walk through afterwards and say, gee, if I knew it was gonna turn out this nice, I would have voted for it instead of against it. Uh, but the proof is in the final product and in the, not only the uh, amenity that you're building and the project that you're building, but also in the services that, that's going forward there. Bill, you know, the other thing is quite frankly, just so you know, a 60-40 win, a 59-41 is considered a very good win. <clears throat> in a project, and let me explain why. In voting for a project, everybody who's against it basically votes. They're much more motivated. People that are for the project do not vote, and people who have not voted in a program are basically two to one in favor of a project. They really, they're just bored, just do it. So we would tell you that a, a real, a 60-40 win like that club had, or very close to have, um, is really a 70-30 win if you could get everybody to vote. But we can't, it seems like we can get about 75% of members to vote on a project. And the last 25 that are basically for it, or they would be voting against it, trust me, are, are basically, you know, are not there. So a 60-40 a a win, or in my opinion, it ends up being a 70-30 win in favor is a very strong win. Then I just think it's like, like I think you're saying, Kevin, is communicate many, many times when we do a project that that 40% who's against it, when it's all done, right? They come back and say, Wow. Yeah. wow, I can't believe I, I was so wrong. You know, they don't have the vision to see it. And I think so you cannot please that group. You have to go with the majority, but just make sure you do it the right way. David just entered in the chat room. They did have a 96% participation rate, which is actually through the roof on, right. the, yeah. on a member vote. So, so they did have a good turnout. Well, we, well, David, you know, it's incumbent on you to make sure that it turns out great then so that we, we, we convert those that 41%. I think that's all the questions that we have at this time. Um, anybody else want to jump in very quickly and put a question in there? We did have a number of folks um, put in. Thank you for the session today. It was great information and a number of people looking for um, the video. So again, the video will come out on Friday in, the, in case you missed it. Um, email that goes out each Friday based on the uh, education that took place during the week. Again, the password is SATISFY with a capital S. Um, the link will be sent to everybody who participated in the call today. It's also in the chat. Kevin, is there anything else that you had that you wanted? 
Yes, just to know to thank you for everyone uh, for being here with us today. And I will let you know that McMahon Group is participating in the Florida Summer Conference at Marco Island. We're doing a pre-conference workshop with Copland, Keebler and Wallace and with Club Benchmarking. That's the Club Leadership Alliance. And we are uh, doing that. The date escapes me, Beth. Um, June 19th. June Sunday, 19th. June 19th. So we'd love to see all of you there on June 19th. And, and I will be there for the entire conference. So I look forward to seeing everyone. And if you need us before, we're just a phone call away. Happy to help in any way we can. Yep. Great. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you. Matt. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for the sunshine. Bye, everybody.